I'm John McKay, and I'm the Member of Parliament for Scarborough Guildwood. Uh, with me today is Larry Watmore, who, um, uh, for whom I've known quite a number of years, not well, but today we're going to talk about Scarborough and particularly the unique qualities of Scarborough and uh, the way in which it is in many instances an underserviced area. So uh, Larry, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Thank you, good, John. Good to see you again. Good to see you Thank again. You. So Larry, let's start at the beginning. So where was Larry Watmore born? Well, I, um, I was born in East York. I was uh, raised well, in that's Scarborough. Not, that's not a Okay, okay, you're coming out. I was going to say that's not a moral failing to be born elsewhere, but uh, I'm glad to hear you're raised in Scarborough. Whereabouts in Scarborough? Um, well, uh, two places. Uh, initially at uh, Birchmount and Eglinton. Mm -hmm. I was there until I was uh, the end of grade three, so I guess that's eight years old. Yeah. And uh, then moved to what was then almost the frontier of Scarborough on Vermorton Drive, uh, east <laughs> of McCowan and just south of Ellesmere. Uh, this <laughs> was in 1964 when the world, I mean, Scarborough stopped at Ellesmere. The only thing north of Ellesmere was CFTO TV uh, exactly, on the north yeah. side of the 401 and all state insurance on the south side of the 401 and everything else was farmland, although not for much longer. Yeah. And that's where I uh, was raised until I left home. And at, at that point, I think the 401 was a, a four lane road rather than a, a 40 lane road. Yep, yeah, it was uh, two lanes each way. Uh, plans were already in place to um, do the, the, the expansion, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. But yes, it was just a just a four lane road and there wasn't even an interchange for McCowan at the 401. No. And McCowan was just a very tiny bridge that went over the 401. So yeah, well, Larry, I think we're going to get into reminiscence here. If I don't get, steer this conversation <laughs> away, but both of us are going to start to reveal our our ages. Um, so where'd you go to school? I went to school well, initially when I was uh, at Birchmount in Eglinton. I went to General Brock, mm -hmm. and then when we moved to um, um, Vermorton, I went to Bendale, Bendale Public. I was uh, the the final grade eight graduating class out of mm -hmm. Bendale before J.S. Woodsworth opened uh, the following year, Senior Public. So they then burned went... the school down after you, after you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went to uh, Woburn Collegiate, uh, did all my high school at Woburn, and then I went to U of T Scarborough to do my undergrad. So I've experienced so what, when, when, were you, when were you at U of T Scarborough? From 1974 to 1979, I was a member well, of the yeah. very first cohort of co-op at oh, co -op. Uh, UTSC okay. yep. and of course that is now a program for which that campus is renowned. Yeah so at the time you were at Woburn was that the smart kid school? Um, well I would like yeah. to think so. You'd like to think so yeah. <laughs> I went to West Hill and Laurier we uh, we of course had the um, rivalry shall we say. Yes yeah. definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now we had the better basketball team I assume we, we, we we from West Hill uh, had the uh, would clobber war, uh, Woburn regularly. Is that so? Is, is that your recollection? Uh, no, I have kind of blocked that out of my mind. I think that uh, <laughs> football was the area in which um, in which uh, uh, Woburn sought to excel and usually right. did. And we yep. also had some pretty good track and field um, track and field teams. We one of our gym teachers was a former Olympian from Eastern Europe who came across mm. uh, Walter Kostrick who uh, was a great um, uh, inspiration for developing track and field athletes at uh, Woburn. And, and what, and what I, was your and sport? I was, and I anything? was not one of them. You were not one of them. I see. I see. I understand that. I had, I had aspirations to be one of them, but clearly uh, no talent. Uh, so my aspiration exceeded my talent by uh, several magnitudes. Uh, a few months or a few years ago, I was at uh, West Hill and uh, we were having a meeting there and I, I happened to look in the gym and the kids were either practicing or just horsing around. I was watching these kids play basketball. I tell you, Larry, there's not a snowball's chance I could have made that team. No chance. What those kids can do with a basketball, yeah. um, I think it defies gravity. So so you're on to UTSC. What did you take there uh, other than being in the co-op program? Well, I was in, uh, at the time, the um, 
UTSC's only co-op program was in public administration, actually. Oh. Mm. So it uh, was a it was a broad range of courses, everything from you know commerce, economics, um, language. I did believe it or not, French immersion at UTSC one summer, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, with a mix of like, you know, math and statistical courses, political science, of course, accounting, it was a broad, it was by, by design, a broad suite of uh, courses so that you would graduate um, with, with being, you know, being more a generalist, if you will, in such a way that you could apply that knowledge to a range of occupations. My recollection of UTSC was uh, the ideal of both worlds. You got U of T professors and you got it in a relatively small setting of, uh, of classes. You didn't have these mega classes that they had downtown. Is that your recollection? Oh, definitely, especially back then, uh, because back then UTSC was much smaller than it is today, both in terms of buildings and populations. It was about maybe one quarter of the size, maybe one third of the size that it is now. So it was much more of an intimate experience. And for me, that was one of the uh, appealing features of it. I know, you know, so, some people uh, would have preferred uh, uh, the St. George campus where it, you know, it's the scale is much more substantial, but where you feel much more anonymous Right. in that right. environment and you didn't feel anonymous at uh, UTSE because you were constantly yeah. rubbing shoulders with people that you would see from class to class and for me that was was part of the appeal of the place aside from the fact that it's also a beautiful setting there yeah I uh, I took um, political sociology there and one of my professors was Bob James Lois oh. James's uh, oh, husband yeah. okay and um, and uh, I, I developed quite a fondness for uh, Bob um, because, uh, you know, you, you, you have certain teachers that are influential in your life. And then I, when I got this job the, at the MP for Scarborough Guildwood, I attended a memorial uh, uh, service for Bob when he died. Oh, this would be at least 15 years ago. And it was a kind of a nice uh, bookend of, um, uh, of somebody who sort of launched you into the direction of law and politics that you ultimately end up in and uh, and uh, you get the opportunity because of your position to speak at the, at, a, at a memorial event no I, I, my time at, at UTSC was just uh, I, the best best three years of my educational life um, anyway so you uh, I'm assuming you graduated Larry um, and uh, did the uh, the uh, degree and co-op degree in in, um, in, co in uh, public administration work for you well, it did, but not in the way that was probably intended. I ended up my, my <laughs> never, life life takes twists and turns. It you never can't, works that way, does it? You, you can't choreograph life. I've yeah, decided, yeah, and yeah. Uh, so yes, I, I my first career was as a banker. And oh, um, that's too bad. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, I I was two years in in um, in uh, personal banking, retail banking, and uh, and. It was a, a great learning experience, learned a ton, um, don't regret it. And uh, that, even though it, it, it didn't sort of perfectly apply the, um, uh, you know, some of the, the, the material, some of the learning that I had at UTSC, the, the fundamentals, as I mentioned earlier, were broad, the academic fundamentals were broad enough that could be, uh, it could be applied in, that, uh, in a banking context. And I learned a lot. I learned mm -hmm. a lot in that first two years. Yeah. So how do you uh, end up uh, being the uh, chief spokesman, uh, spokesperson, I guess, to be correct, uh, for your love of all things Scarborough? Um, because uh, you, re you really have kind of cut out a niche for your, yourself uh, and um, along with your colleagues um, to really put, try to put Scarborough on the map. So Tell me how does how does that come about, and um, and then we can get into the conversation about what we need to talk about with Scarborough. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll provide a bit of, of a meandering answer, but I will come to my point. So <laughs> okay. after after I um, spent two years at TD, I went back to school uh, to York University, got an MBA there, returned to banking TD, and uh, spent eight more years with 
TD and commercial banking, also a great learning experience. But during that time developed a real sort of passion for, for community service and volunteer service. And I ended up moving from banking into being the uh, chief financial officer of a social service agency in the city of Toronto called Wood Green Community Services, uh, where I served for 25 years and developed a, you know, a real passion for, um, for community service at that level through a social service agency. And also at that time got involved uh, in other volunteer other organizations as a volunteer, including Rotary. You're probably familiar with Rotary. Yep. There are yep. Rotary clubs all over the place. And I'm still uh, a member of Rotary. And a number of several years ago, by which time I was back living in Scarborough, getting very involved in the community through my community association here in, in West Rouge, where I live. I was president of the West Rouge Community Association for three years. I'm still very involved in the community association, still very involved in Rotary. And a few years ago, 2014 to 2016 in that range, Rotary got involved in what was framed as a Renew Scarborough campaign. And I was kind of on the periphery of this because I wasn't deeply involved um, in, in sort of the rotary circles at that time. But I was very aware of the initiative that was being taken place by Scarborough's five rotary clubs, which was essentially a very broad community consultation exercise to get people to talk about what do we need to do in Scarborough in order to get ourselves a better deal? And at the same time, try to reframe how people think about Scarborough because Scarborough gets a bad rap. And, you know, sometimes we have our issues like any other big city does, but there's also a lot to be proud of and there's a lot to celebrate here in Scarborough and a lot of that was being overlooked. So through this Renew Scarborough campaign, Rotary was trying to flesh out all these issues and create sustainable volunteer led organizations coming out of this campaign that could carry that message forward. So out of this Renew Scarborough campaign led by Scarborough five, Scarborough's five Rotary Clubs, three new organizations were created. One is the Institute for New Suburbanism, which is a, what you might call a suburban planning uh, policy think tank, because so much of what passes for uh, planning policy nowadays is really very downtown centric in its thinking. And we want a, a foil to that. We want to create um, uh, a think tank environment that is focused on the needs of suburban communities, not necessarily the needs of downtown communities because they that, can be different. That's, that's quite interesting. I, um, I've, I've intuitively felt that. So give me an, give me an example of, uh, if you will, uh, downtown centric planning versus suburban centric planning? Um, well, downtown centric planning is um, predicated on the notion of high density, of Main Street retail, of um, walkable and, and bikeable um, communities, uh, of you know, deep public transit, and that um, that should be the template that applies to suburban communities as well. And what we're saying in, in a suburban context is, well, well, first of all, people choose to live in suburbs because they're different from mm -hmm. the city center uh, and, and, and in a whole bunch of very positive ways. If, if, if you got kids and you like a backyard, <laughs> it's just a yeah. very different idea. Yeah. And, you know, and there's, there's, there's pros and cons to each, um, um, to each setting, um, you know, some people, and, and, you know, this is, you know, some people really love the, you know, the buzz of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. urban downtown living, the, you know, the, the congestion that comes with that the high housing costs that, that come with that, but there's a real, you know, you get, you get lots of urban amenities in the center of the city that, that you don't get elsewhere. So there's certainly advantages to living in, you know, in, in downtown urban environments, if those features are important to you, but not everybody has the same 
priorities for making decisions about where they choose to live. Other people have different priorities and therefore choose suburban environments where it's a little less, con a whole lot less congested, uh, where there is an opportunity to uh, live in uh, less dense environments, where there's more green space, where um, the, the housing prices are still relatively speaking uh, much more affordable. Yes, there are um, trade-offs that come with that. Some of us have longer commutes to work, assuming that we're going back to working in offices in <laughs> yeah. a pre-pandemic kind of way, which is another discussion. But, but tie, tie, uh, Larry, tie me into the, uh, the, the Scarborough subway announcement, which is where we last met. Um, and obviously your enthusiasm for uh, the, uh, the Scarborough subway and how does that, uh, and, and the argument against uh, this uh, three or four or $5 billion project, whatever it is these days, uh, has been that there's not enough quote unquote density. So um, if there's not enough density and we'll take that argument for, without challenging it for the time being, uh, if there's not enough density, how does the new uh, Inst Institute for New Suburbanism um, square that um, that peg with the round hole? Well, I think that there's, I mean, it is, it is a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, there's, first of all, I think the Scarborough, the extension of the Scarborough subway is very much needed. And there's a fairly broad consensus in Scarborough that that is aligned with that. And there's, there's, I guess there's two, two answers that I would, would have to that. Number one is I remember to tie back to what we talked about in days yes. of yore, yes, I when the whole Scarborough Civic Center, Scarborough Town Center area was envisioned back in the mm -hmm. 1970s as being this node of development within Scarborough in part to take pressure off of downtown. And there was going to be also a node of the same nature in North York and another one in Etobicoke. And of those three nodes, the only one that's really taken off with, you know, all you know, the kind of North prosperity York. is North York. Um, and, you know, because North York, in part because North York has a subway connection. There's a subway right. connection to North York Center that is not applied either at Etobicoke or Scarborough. So I think getting that subway connection from Kennedy to Scarborough Center is going to be a real game changer in terms of creating that kind of vitality and prosperity um, in, in that node that was always contemplated for that area, but never really quite happened. So I think there that's going to be a significant benefit um, um, or, or rising from the Scarborough subway, um, first of all. Secondly, uh, there's no denying, and, and there will be some challenges associated with this, that there will be development intensification along the subway line, especially near the uh, the, 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 the subway the stations, stations, be it yep. Lawrence, be it Scarborough Center, which we already have, and, and at Shepherd. And you know there will be some development tensions that come with that, no, no denying that. But if there is going to be intensification in Scarborough, in part to address the fact that there's going to be a whole lot more people moving to Scarborough, probably in the next 20 to 30 years, and we need to make some provision for that in a way that minimally disrupts established neighborhoods. And secondly, if we're going to maximize the investment in a higher order public transit, then there probably does need to be some intensification along um, the, 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 the subway extension and in particular at those three um, subway stops. And that yeah, they, will improve they, they, the business case of that subway right. extension. But the example I would use is the, is the uh, subway or the subway to nowhere along Shepherd Avenue there. And, um, you know, over the 20 or 30 years that it's existed, with, a, with frankly a low uh, density or a low ridership. Um, uh, there has been development nodes at uh, Bayview and Leslie and uh, and of course at its terminus at, the, at Victoria Park there, or not Victoria Park, but at the um, 404. And um, I, I think you're right to assume that the Scarborough subway will, de uh, will develop um, at, at particular nodes because it'll be easy access for, for people. But the, the other point I wanted to make was that it hasn't, 
um, massively impacted uh, the um, residents of North York uh, in the in the in the if you will the uh, single housing area and the and uh, the lower density areas. Yeah, and and that's always the challenge from a. Um, you know, planning policy and community engagement perspective is there's always been a desire and I think a good one not to disrupt the character of established neighborhoods which are working well that if there's going to be additional development both residential and commercial by the way because we need to we need to do we need more employment for these people for right, right. And, and for Scarborough generally that they take place along the arterial roads and a particular along the arterial arterial roads that are serviced by higher order public transit. We're seeing that already, of course, along Eglinton Avenue from Victoria Park to Kennedy Station, where the um, the Eglinton East LRT is uh, under construction now, and that is being a catalyst for all sorts of development intensification along Eglinton. And I do think that the next frontier, and we've talked about transit frontiers, the first one, of course, being the extension of the Scarborough, Scarborough subway for which we now have shovels in the ground. We talked, of course, about the uh, desire for the extension of the Eglinton East light rapid transit uh, project east from Kennedy Station to U of T Scarborough and, and also to and then to to Malvern, which is something that I mentioned during our during the Prime Minister's uh, virtual whistle stop that I, I know that oh, you that and the Scarborough caucus are all over that. And oh, then eventually and, we'll, and, yeah. and then eventually we'll get to uh, the extension of the Shepherd subway as well to right. connect it to to to, Sh to Shepherd station. So that's that's also part of the next frontier. Well, that, Sorry, that run on you. the uh, Eglinton East, uh, that would incorporate um, a whole, uh, I think its main uh, function will be incorporate a, a U of T, a UTSC into the subway system, or not the subway system, into the rapid transit system. Yeah. Uh, but it also, um, certainly from Kennedy all the way out to Morningside, goes through a number of high priority no neighborhoods. And uh, if high priority neighborhoods have um, decent transit, then they become less high priority neighborhoods. Not as if they suddenly lose their character, but they, um, uh, but there, there's a, a real chance of the uh, reduction in in poverty because people can actually get to work. And that's and, and and that's been borne out so much during the pandemic. Um, even though you know the GO trains are don't have a lot of passengers on them right now, the subway has fewer passengers on them right now because there's less commuter traffic going into the city. You go into North Scarborough, and I I, I hear this secondhand because personally I'm not affected by this, but in North Scarborough where we have so many um, residents working in essential employment where they can't work from home. They've got to report to a workplace. In a lot of cases, they don't have cars, so they're reliant on public transit. So they, the, the bus routes in Northern Scarborough, I'm told are almost as congested now as they were um, uh, pre really? pre pandemic mm. because, yeah. you know, they got to get to work and yeah. those commute times are punishing. Uh, and also, a really unfortunate part in the current circumstances is that in, in times of COVID, that there's still a lot of congestion on those buses as well. So higher order public transit to serve those disadvantaged communities in eastern and northern Scarborough uh, is, I think, a really important priority for, um, for the next phase of improvement of public transit in Scarborough. because. Scarborough is still so underserved when it comes to public transit relative to the size of Scarborough geographically and relative to the size of our population. So it's important that we, you know, keep focused on that big goal. I've had this thought that Scarborough gets the bad rap um, and kind of a self-reinforcing um, methodology that the, the transit sucks, therefore um, housing prices are depressed. And housing prices are depressed. That um, brings out people who can only afford um, lower lower prices for rent and for mortgages, and uh, that in turn um, uh, creates more uh, transit challenges. Uh, transit challenges then uh, lead to um, uh, poor quality housing, and the whole thing becomes uh, interlocked. And and what becomes a kernel of truth becomes uh, a um, 
a massive uh, reputational damage to the community. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, reported upon by the media with not a great deal of nuance. I'd be interested in your uh, your thoughts on um, the reputational damage that Scarborough has sustained, I would say, for a minimum of 25 years. Well, as Rodney Dangerfield might say, Scarborough don't get no respect. <laughs> don't get no respect, yes. <laughs> and... And, you know, and, and there's no denying we have our challenges in Scarborough. I mean, let's not sugarcoat that. And we've talked about one of them, the fact that we have uh, underdeveloped rapid transit infrastructure. We have some real challenges, I think, with other parts of infrastructure as well. Our, our, our hospitals could use a whole lot more public investment that our, our hospital, our hospital campuses could use a whole lot more public investment um, than they've, they've had so far. So there's, there's, there are there are certainly infrastructure challenges that affect us uh, in Scarborough, but there's also a lot to um, be uh, to, to recognize Scarborough for as as well, and that tends not to get. I mean, we have a lot. We have terrific green space in in, in Scarborough. Uh, we have some really nice neighborhoods in Scarborough. We've got uh, the Scarborough Bluffs. We have the zoo. We have a terrific community college in Centennial College. We have a world-class university campus in UTSC. So there's some really great features about Scarborough that tend not to get recognized by a lot of the um, exactly urban thinkers who, who, again, tend to be focused on the downtown and they portray Scarborough in tiresome stereotypes. We're all familiar with the Scarberia label, which uh, has which has been a term of uh, derision in the past, although there are, now, um, there are, part, there are efforts in Scarborough there, right? to yeah. reclaim that term as, yeah, as yeah. being a term of endearment. So, yeah. so stay tuned for that one. It's uh, yeah. because yeah. There's, there's reasons to be proud. Of, uh, well, there's reasons to be proud, but also reasons to be optimistic. Um, you know, there is the symbolism of the Scarborough subway, but also the uh, ongoing pressure for the East um, Eglinton East uh, LRT, and um, and I think the the message, particularly with, um, has landed with the mayor uh, that uh, that Scarborough does get uh, the short end of every stick. I know in our 416 caucus meetings, my colleagues are sick of our Scarborough caucus, sick of listening to the issues on uh, Scarborough, sick of listening to the, the underserviced uh, elements of Scarborough, sick of listening to the needs for uh, transit, sick of uh, the short, being shortchanged on the Scarborough Health Network um, uh, vaccine rollout. And um, uh, to the point where it's almost become a bit of a joke with the chair, uh, about um, about uh, uh, okay okay McKay okay and it's angry what what's the Scarborough perspective on this so anyways it's nice to be uh, nice to be heard shall we say and, well, before I let you uh, yeah before I let you go there I, I do want you to, to kind of uh, get to that point of of um, what vision do you see for Scarborough hopefully within both yours and my lifetime um, of how you anticipate that um, uh, the the change will happen, and where do you anticipate the change will happen? Well, um, the mission of SCRO boiled down into a nutshell. SCRO being, of course, the Scarborough yep. Community Renewal Organization, is to connect, promote, and renew Scarborough, so Scarborough can be strong and prosperous. One way in which we do that is by doing advocacy to promote Scarborough's interests, which is the primary reason why Scro exists, because as you rightly point out, Scarborough in the past didn't toot its own horn, didn't make its own case for um, why politicians should pay attention to Scarborough. So we're trying to um, reframe that now so that those voices are being heard and that SCRO and the Scarborough Business Association, which is the other organization that came out of this Rotary Renew Scarborough campaign. So we have the Institute for New Suburbanism, we have the Scarborough Business Association, and we have the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization, all beating this drum for a more prosperous and renewed Scarborough. And that's going to happen over time 
and on many fronts. We through um, part of it will be through improved infrastructure that we through improved hard infrastructure as we've just talked about. Part of it is through improved social infrastructure because the reality is that we still need supports for um, those members of our community that are struggling and in particular are very vibrant but also still um, um, are very vibrant newcomer community but which also has particular requirements that we need to satisfy in order to um, in order to fully integrate them into Scarborough and, and Canadian society. So making sure that we have that kind of infrastructure is in place is also going to be important as well. But also, to repeat, uh, reframing how we, those of us who have chosen to live and raise families here in Scarborough, think about Scarborough so that we don't think about Scarborough as being a consolation prize, that rather we think about Scarborough as being a first choice that we've chosen to live in for a whole bunch of very positive reasons. And to reframe how public policy leaders from other parts of Canada and in particular downtown, think about Scarborough so they no longer think about mm -hmm. Scarborough in tiresome stereotypes. Yeah. So that's, so that, amplification is going to be important as well because to a certain extent um, um, reframing how people think about Scarborough uh, will cre create a different brand for this yeah. place and I mentioned it's earlier a, that it's a virtuous cycle yes. yeah yeah and I mentioned earlier how the Scarborough Community Renewal Organization is now operating the Scarborough Walk of Fame which is mm -hmm. something that celebrates people who've made great contributions uh, either from Scarborough or off to Scarborough uh, over, over, their, uh, over their lifetime, often featuring people in, in the arts, but also other aspects of uh, public life. And because there's another way in which Scarborough can toot its horns, own horn saying, you know, we've got some really inspiring and talented people that have come from Scarborough and done great things in life or who are doing great things in Scarborough now. We should recognize that. Well, well Larry, um, if you need a campaign manager for the Scarborough mayor uh, position, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to uh, volunteer. Uh, I'll volunteer Layla. She'd be a much better uh, volunteer, <laughs> uh, a much better campaign manager than I. But before I let you go, um, uh, as you know, this is a podcast about what we give. And it's, it's actually a direct steal from a phrase uh, by, um, by um, Winston Churchill. And I, what I like to ask people is not only uh, because you told us what you give and, you know, three organizations that you've been part of, you've been pushing for this for years and years and years, and you've had some considerable success. Um, why do you do it? Well, so do this, it is, this is a I miracle, ladies and gentlemen. Larry, Larry Watmore was uh, at a loss for words for at least five seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I do it because uh, I have a passion for this place. And I do it because, uh, you know, I, I, and I don't want to you know, over dramatize this, but I think, uh, you know, those of us who, who have the opportunity to make contributions for the better, the, the benefit of our community and the benefit of, of our society uh, should seize that opportunity to do so. What is it to, who is it that was, I can't recall who it was that said you make a living by what you give but you that's what that's what our podcast is that's Winston Churchill was you it make really a living by what you give or what you make yes. and you make a life by what you give thank and you that's okay well there you can't get a, a nicer segue to uh yeah. thanking you uh Larry for uh for uh, literally uh sharing us uh sharing with us your uh, passion for Scarborough um I think we would all be um well serviced um, if um, if there were more Larry Watmores. And as I say, if you ever want to run for mayor of Scarborough, just, just let us know when we'll, we'll get the signs all dusted off. Uh, I think there's lots of Larry Watmores out there. We just need to provide them with a platform to uh, come together and to cheerlead all good things Scarborough. I, I agree with that, but only one name ends up on the sign. So there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so again, thank you, Larry, and uh, we appreciate you uh, making making yourself available.
Well, thank you for the opportunity. And, and of course, thank you and to your colleagues for uh, all the uh, cheerleading that you've been doing to promote Scarborough in, um, in uh, federal government circles as well, because that's, that's obviously an important ingredient. We got to keep beating that drum. Thanks again. Thank you.